I'm Ed Wilkinson, and I'm on the block here in Bath Beach at Most Precious Blood Parish with the pastor, Father John Maduri. Dory, uh, here we are on the stoop in, uh, Bay, in Bay Ridge in Bath Beach. Beach. Um, you know, one of the things we always like to ask priests about is where their vocation came from. And uh, I know you went to, you didn't go to the minor seminary, you didn't go to the prep seminary. No. You went to St. Francis Prep. Uh, where did the, the roots of your vocation come from? Interesting story. When I was in the eighth grade, one of the nuns at the uh, parish asked me about going to the prep, and I said, no way, I had no interest in the priesthood. <laughs> But in October of my senior year in high school, uh, three of my uh, uh, friends from the high school were killed in a car accident. Two of them were classmates of mine. And it just got me thinking, you know, uh, if life can be snuffed out so fast, if it can just end so quickly, mm -hmm. there's gotta be more than just, you know, fulfilling what I wanna do. Mm -hmm. You know, cause my plan was, you know, get married, have kids, be an architect, or go into business and all that. But it just sent me on a path of just thinking, you know, uh, again, if life can end so quickly, there's gotta be something more than just satisfying myself. Mm -hmm. And just as time went on, I just, uh, you know, began to discern the priesthood. I knew Monsignor Cooney very well from the prep. He was a great influence. Mm -hmm. We had a very good priest over at St. Simon in Jew where I was raised. So I always had a very good uh, positive feeling about priests. Mm -hmm. So it just really rolled from there, yeah. you know. So when you finally uh, made that decision, well, maybe I'm going to try this out, what did you do? You went to the uh, college seminary? Then? Yeah, actually, I was registered to go to Baruch. <laughs> and at the last minute, I went to Douglaston. Yeah, I'm going to call divine inspiration, I'm not sure. But I started there actually three days late. Uh -huh. But something just said go there. And I went there for the four years. Uh, but I was working you know, part-time at the federal government, at the World Trade Center, uh, during the winter's break and during the summers. I went full-time for a year with the government, and then I went for a year to Capuchins. Huh. And uh, that wasn't for me. I found out too independent for community life. <laughs> so I went to the diocese, and here I am 27 and a half years later. Wow. Yeah. So uh, so did you go to the diocesan seminary system then? You, you studied that uh, in Huntington? Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. What was that experience like? Because I, for a lot of guys, it's a time of discernment and, and questioning. Uh, uh, is it a time, a period, when you're constantly asking yourself, is this what I really want to do? And did you ever have any doubts? Of I think at that point, no, only because I had gone through Douglaston. I did the novitiate year in the postulancy with the Capuchins. So I think at that point, the discernment for me wasn't about being a priest or not, but a diocesan or religious order. Mm -hmm. And once I made that discernment to go into the diocesan priesthood, I mean, I was pretty well set, you know, yeah. this is what I wanted to do. And the seminary just reinforced that for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you enjoy the seminary experience? I did. You know, some guys, you know, had negative experiences. <laughs> I have to honestly, you know, yeah, yeah. but uh, I didn't find it that bad at all. I mean, I, I enjoyed it for mm -hmm. the most part, you yeah. know. What did your friends and your family say to you when uh, they became aware of the fact that you were thinking of becoming a priest? My father's uh, attitude was a short life, you have to do what makes you happy. My mother's was, she was concerned. She thought it was a lonely life. Mm -hmm. You know, although now she'll tell anybody she meets, my son's happy, so I'm happy. <laughs> but she was concerned about the loneliness factor. Mm -hmm. uh, I have no time to be lonely. I wish I did. <laughs> uh, friends were mixed. Some of them, you know, uh, I was always a churchgoer like that, so mm -hmm. some were not overly surprised. Others were very surprised. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a mixed bag. Yeah. yeah. Now you mentioned before that, uh, you know, you thought that you would grow up and uh, have a family. and. Uh, one of the things about being a priest is you have to promise celibacy. Mm -hmm. uh, is that a difficult decision uh, to make? And then is it a difficult life to live? 
it's a difficult decision to make because it's permanent, you know, uh, but it's a day-by-day -day commitment. And I think the reason why sometimes guys fail in it is because they don't renew themselves in their priestly ministry, in their celibate commitment. Mm -hmm. But if every day a guy got up and just, you know, promised to God you're going to do this faithfully again. Mm -hmm. So um, as I get older, I guess when I was younger, it's more the physical aspect you're missing. When you get older, it's more the the personal intimacy with another person that you miss. Mm -hmm. But I have to say, you know, I mean, th thanks be to God, it's His grace. I've had, you know, 27 and a half very good years, very happy years. Mm -hmm. So whatever I feel I've missed, I, I think I've gained a lot more by, by God's goodness. Mm -hmm. And like you say, you're very busy. Uh, yeah. Uh, being a pastor mm -hmm. uh, here in Bath Beach, so mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about Most Precious Blood Parish. What's it like? Well, the parish community, like I said, was founded in 1926 out of a Lady of Silas in Coney Island, a German community and parish, mm -hmm. until after the Second World War. And then by the late 40s, 50s, Italians came in in droves. And it was predominantly uh, an Italian, an Italian American community from the 50s right until about the year 2000. Mm -hmm. uh, even the projects up here at that point came up after World War II, and they were mostly Irish and Italian. Uh, soldiers coming back from the war. So the parish took, you know, a, a big hit as far as its population when the, when the projects went from predominantly Catholic to predominantly non-Catholic population. But the larger area stayed overwhelmingly Italian Catholic. But just like the surrounding neighbors, by the late 90s, early 2000s, the demographic shifts hit dramatically. So an area that was more than 90% Italian American Catholic uh, is now probably no more than 20, 25% Italian-American Catholic. The rest is heavily Chinese, uh, Russian. And according to demographics that our local politicians have shown me, over the next 10 years, Hispanic immigration is supposed to outpace everybody else. Wow. So that's why the parish, we had to move from uh, where we were to another model where we were no longer an Italian-American community. So it could no longer be an Italian-American parish only. We had to reach out. And so we began, you know, the work of evangelization, particularly to the Hispanic community. We started the Spanish Mass. I have a priest from Cuba with me now for five years, and that's building up, you know, noticeably. Mm -hmm. And now in February, we're going to start Chinese New Year and start reaching out to the uh, Chinese community. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. How are you going to do that? Yeah, I mean, do you have a Chinese priest or...? Uh... No, but this area, is, I would say, is predominantly second and third generation Chinese. So they speak English as a second or third language. They just don't have the invitation out there to explore the Catholic Church, you know, here at Most Precious Blood. So that's the, the, uh, the idea of the Chinese New Year, just to welcome them in. Yeah. We'll have a prayer service in the church, bilingual, Chinese and English. Bless the picture of Our Lady of China have a reception after that, you know, for the actual New Year celebration, and then tell them a little about who we are as a parish and church community, and then we'll start, hopefully get the ball rolling after that in terms of evangelization and, and inviting them to explore the faith. I mean, you know, we hear Bishop DeMarzio talk a lot about the new evangelization. Uh, what does new evangelization mean in the most precious blood parish? Here it takes on uh, two meanings, actually three meanings. First, it's reaching out and bringing the gospel to the historic, you know, Catholic community that's been here for several decades. Mm -hmm. That is oftentimes indifferent, you know, or just grown cold or whatever, apathetic. Uh, some hostility because of the school closing five and a half years ago. Okay. Uh, so it's trying to reach them with the richness of the faith that they really did have at one point. Uh, the other, of course, is the immigrant Hispanic community, which is predominantly Catholic, mm -hmm. but letting them know that the parish is a welcoming community as the church is a welcoming community. And with the Chinese, it's just a matter of, of reaching out to an entirely non-Christian community and trying to introduce the person of Jesus Christ to them, you know. But ultimately, whether it's the Italian-American, the Chinese, the uh, Hispanic community, or even the Russian community, uh, whether they're Christian or not, it's just trying to introduce the person of Jesus Christ, no one new. Mm -hmm. It's always a tough thing, you mentioned the school closing, and that's always a tough, uh, a tough thing for any neighborhood, and you go through a period of grief and you know, suffering. How does, uh, 
how did you help the, how do you help the parish get over something like mm -hmm. that Cause there are a lot of places particularly like in new york now with a lot of parishes that are going to be closing mm -hmm. and merging uh how do you as a pastor approach the people to, to and help them get over mm -hmm. that grief when the, par the school closed, I, I got here two weeks after it closed, so I missed all the excitement. <laughs> but you got the <laughs> I got the aftermath of the war, you know. Yeah. But I was fortunate because people didn't blame me, you know. Um, but basically what I did was just try to bring the community together. And I did that two ways. First, I started this, uh, I brought into the parish this thing called New Evangelization Ministries from Ohio. And I brought together nine, 19 leaders of all different ages, including uh, school parents, four school parents. Mm -hmm. And we met over four weekends uh, during the course of the year to discuss how we rebuild the parish and, and make it a, a strong faith community. So engaging the larger parish, engaging some of the school parents was a big plus. And as a, as a flowing out of that, I also made myself available to parents who wanted to talk and you know, kind of vent. And they were very respectful. But I gave them an opportunity just to kind of express what they went through, what they were feeling, you know, about the parish, about the school closing and all of that. The second thing I did was just to go into the pulpit and just announce very quickly what we were going to do for the parish to build it up. And I think that built up excitement. Uh, I think some of the school parents who were aware of it, they felt, all right, at least they're getting something back from the parish after the school closed. Simple thing I had was an end of summer barbecue that September. I had 260 some odd people showed up, you know, and that just brought people together, and it gave people a, a, just a good sense of the you know the parish is here to stay, we're here to stay. Mm -hmm. The school was a loss, but it doesn't define the parish solely by itself. Mm -hmm. There's much more to it. Mm -hmm. So I think all that coming together, getting parishioners, active parishioners, school parents together, both to learn about evangelization, to listen to them to do social things that brought us together, I think made a very good first step. Yeah. Uh, what do you do in terms of lay ministry here? I know that you, you try a lot of different things down here. You had a lot of discussions about men's spirituality. That was one topic you addressed. And uh, how much do you depend on lay leadership here? Oh, a great deal, a great deal. Because that whole new evangelization ministry where this deacon Ralph Poyo came up from Ohio, was basically laying out for these 19 people the foundation of what it meant for them to be leaders uh, in the community of Most Precious Blood. Mm -hmm. And not all, but I would say the great majority of them it took up the mantle. So when it came time to start the Women of Grace, Women's in Industry, the King's Men, uh, the prayer groups, do life and the growth in the spirit seminars, to start the youth ministries and what have you, mm -hmm. uh, I had this, this core of people that began to grow now to about 35. Um, within the Italian American community, probably another 20 in the Hispanic community, who really at this point very much understand that the power doesn't rise and fall on me, mm -hmm. but really rises and falls on their leadership, you know? So they're out there, I mean, to their credit, I mean, they're talking to people, um, they're bringing people in, they, they challenge people who challenge their faith. Mm -hmm. uh, they're equipped, most of them, to do that. Uh, so it's been a very positive thing to watch. Even, I guess it was three Sundays back, and there were 34 the Italian-American community, helped me with the Chinese evangelization, and they were all excited about it. I met with the Hispanic you know, leadership last night to help out with it all, so they were thrilled about it. Mm -hmm. So I think it was really instilling them for the last five years that we can't think about the parish ethnically, but what it is. It's, it's the home where Jesus Christ is to come alive in our lives, whether we're Italian, Hispanic, Chinese, whatever the case might be. Mm -hmm. So that core of people gets it. I think the wider community, you know, is getting it, you know, uh, also little by little. Yeah. It's a beautiful church, and I was saying to you before that you have to know uh, where you're going to get to this place. Yes. Because so it's kind of like off the beaten very track. Very much so. And it's really kind of like a hidden gem down here in, in Bath Beach. Uh, what is your mass attendance like? Uh, when I got here, it was probably less than 500. Uh, we probably, we got to the low 700s at one point. But we're dipping down again because uh, the Italian community is still moving out. Mm. You know, we lost about 75 people last year alone wow. who were practicing. So the, uh, now it's about 6.30, mm -hmm. 6.40 on a good Sunday. But what's, what's not making it collapse altogether is the fact that the Hispanic community has grown from about 8 to 130. Mm. You know, so that's where you're seeing the shift. Uh, there's going to be for the next, I would say the next five years, it's going to be seesawing. Mm -hmm as the Italian community still continues to leave, the Hispanics come in, uh, it's going to seesaw. Mm -hmm. 
But I think once the Hispanic community is stabilized and grows, I think then we'll start seeing you know, a, a stable growth in the parish. Yeah. I know that in some of your previous assignments, you've always been involved in youth ministry. That's mm -hmm. been a particular interest of yours. And, uh, how, how have you brought that here to Most Precious Blood? My second year here, we had a three-year agreement with this group called uh, Dirty Vagabonds, believe it or not. <laughs> That's their name. I didn't give it to them. Uh, out of Steubenville, Ohio. A, a lot of the ministries here came out of Franciscan University in Steubenville, mm -hmm. uh, and some of their uh, ministries that you know, flowed from that university. And I had two terrific youth ministers, uh, Andy and Cree, they were the best. And they literally did what I wanted the, the larger community to do, which is to go out into the streets and bring people in. And they literally went to uh, John Dewey High School, to Lafayette, to the Marlboro Projects, to the parks on Cropsey Avenue. And they bring in 50, 60 kids a week, you know. And for the three years they were here, we were probably baptizing at least four or five uh, of kids who either uh, no, had no religion or were converting mm -hmm. uh, from another faith. Um, so that's been a plus. They left after three years. Mm -hmm. They didn't have anybody to send me, so uh, now we cluster with the, the Bensonhurst cluster parishes, Ken Waldenowski, mm -hmm. who's doing a phenomenal job here also. Mm -hmm. And uh, that outreach is really continuing. Uh, the good thing is that I was concerned when Dirty Vagabonds left, where we have this outreach going on. Mm -hmm. But some of those uh, young people who are now like 18, 19 years old who were baptized, they're the ones who are bringing kids in uh, that they know. Sure. So uh, even though they're not former youth ministers, yeah. they've learned well from the other youth ministers. And we get like you know, 25, 30 more kids right, right now on any given week. Yeah. And it's, it's their work that's bringing them in. And that's only going to grow, I'm sure, you know, as time goes on. You say to a, uh, a young man or a young woman who's thinking about uh, uh, joining a religious life these days. Uh, mm -hmm be encouraging, I guess, right? Definitely. I, mean, I can't speak for religious life because they're their own charism, but certainly <laughs> I would encourage it because I think it's a, it's a very rich and rewarding life to live. Mm -hmm. uh, if they live it in the heart of the church, you know, and live it with fidelity. Uh, I said when I, a long time ago, I said Mass at Cathedral Prep in Elmhurst, and I, I just said to the guys there at the end, mm -hmm. if you live it well, it's a great life. And I think that's the key thing. If, if a man is considering the priesthood or a woman religious life or, or the brotherhood, whatever it may be for a man, uh, if you intend to live it well and faithfully, it's a great life, mm -hmm. you know. Now, how come the Franciscan brothers didn't get you at St. Francis Prep? Why did you choose priesthood and then I don't the know. Brothers? You have to ask them. I'm not sure. <laughs> So uh, you're optimistic about uh, the, the faith here in uh, Bath Beach. Uh, if you were to project out now, uh, you know, say 10 years, uh, I guess the greatest difference you would see is what's going to be in the ethnic makeup. Of the yeah, I mean, I, I came here five and a half years ago thinking that I would build up the Italian-American community. And it was them who, uh, and the parish pastoral council members came to me and said, we need Hispanic ministry. I wasn't aware there's so many Hispanics here. Mm -hmm. And so the Italian community really introduced me to that. But now I'm realizing that uh, if I get a second term for another six years after this, mm -hmm. I'll really be transitioning the parish from an Italian-American parish to an Hispanic parish. And I think then it will uh, be a very vibrant and um, uh, viable parish you know, for the future. Sure. Well, they say God is a God of surprises. Yeah. You know? And I tell my people all the time, because they get discouraged sometimes, you know, we bring people in and then they move out, you know. So I tell them, I said, you know, I look at the parish as a parish community, but also as a university. Because when you go to college, you train them four years and you send them out. Mm -hmm. I was doing the same thing here. A lot of the work we do here is bringing people in, but they move. So hopefully what they learn here, they bring to Staten Island, New Jersey, <laughs> wherever they're going, mm -hmm. you know. So you still have a purpose. I also try to encourage them that, you know, we are sowing the seeds here. But we're not, not necessarily going to see the fruits of that, mm -hmm. you know, see the harvest. Yeah. So we have to have that trust that God is um, going to bring harvest out of the seeds we sow. Well, thanks for being with us today on the block here in Bath Beach at Most Precious Blood Parish. And I want to thank Father John Maduri for his time and for his insights. My pleasure.